Clinical Senior Lecturer or Associate Professor now, I believe. Um, I had a correction this morning um, at the University of Sydney, Sydney Medical School. She also works as a hearing member for the New South Wales Medical Council Health Program. And Dr. Dorr has extensive clinical and research experience in general adult psychiatry and addiction medicine in both mental health and drug and alcohol settings. Dr. Dorr has been a key figure in the implementation of the Involuntary Drug and Alcohol Treatment Program in New South Wales, where she's Director of the IDAP Program at RNS Hospital Sydney. So, um, with great pleasure, Glenys. Thank you so much, Michael, and uh, also Peter, and the rest of the organising committee, and to Rose fellow Kiwi, um, for organising this great conference. And thank you to all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here today. I have to say, I feel a little bit like I've just won an award um, getting to speak in a plenary session with very famous Loretta Finnegan and stepping in for Kathleen Brady. Um, both of you are outstanding women in the drug and alcohol field and, and I admire your work so much, so what a privilege. Today I want to start my talk by introducing you, we're kind of moving from babies to hobbits. Um, very Kiwi. I want to start my talk by introducing you to a 59-year-old man whose stocky and hirsute features are reminiscent of the hobbit-like creatures in the Lord of the Rings epic. So we'll call him Mr Baggins. The call came through to Triple O. Help me! Help me now! He yelled down the line in a drunken stupor. I'm in pain. Pain in my chest. I'm going to die. I'll kill myself if you don't come now. Help me or I'll kill myself. It was Monday, the 3rd of September, 2012. Police and ambulance rushed to the man. They found him in a state of squalor his home lined with a shabby detritus of the streets and the familiar accoutrements of extreme alcoholism. Metho bottles strewn, half full, half empty throughout the bedroom. Officers found him both sobbing and yelling with fear, his hands clutching his chest. Their gaze was immediately focused on the long kitchen knife, improvisedly strapped to his lower leg. Mr Baggins was transported to the emergency department at Royal North Shore Hospital, whereupon the staff noted with a sense of Groundhog Day that this was his 114th presentation to the emergency department. This time, however, a new treatment plan was in place. Mr Baggins was about to embark on a new treatment journey. Myself and the team from the Herbert Street Clinic were waiting expectantly for the clock to strike midnight. For at the stroke of 12, the day would usher in new legislation and thus a new treatment pathway for Mr Baggins. <laughs> Now, this is, um, Mr Baggins ha has been what many of you would call a frequent flyer to the emergency department, and in the six months alone from May to October in 2011, he had 56 presentations to the emergency department. From the 4th of September, however, things were starting to change. There was the implementation of the Drug and Alcohol Treatment Act 2007 in New South Wales and this was an act that had been trialled previously for 18 months to two years at Nepean Hospital in New South Wales. This act was rolled out in two statewide designated treatment facilities. One was in our unit at Herbert Street, Royal North Shore Hospital as um, one of four of 15 beds and eight beds were available in Bloomfield Hospital in Orange. 
This Act replaced the Inebriates Act 1912, and we were very excited and had a birthday party um, for the Inebriates Act, which basically was uh, dead and buried on its 100th birthday, going, going, gone. This Act had been widely criticised, and some of the criticisms I've outlined here today, um, it allowed for detention in facilities for the severely mentally ill. And this occurred from 1929. So in the absence of any other standalone designated drug and alcohol treatment services, uh, alleged inebriates were placed in the major psychiatric hospitals. And this stopgap measure um, occurred in 1929 and continued until 2012. This allowed detention in psychiatric hospitals for the severely mentally ill for up to 12 months. And this could occur without any kind of mandatory legal review of the order. The treating staff and the medical superintendent had no power to discharge the patient. The provision of drug and alcohol treatment was very ad hoc at best. And there was no oversight of this treatment provided. And no evidence of effectiveness was ever reviewed. Concerns about involuntary treatment are, are summarised in this quote. The withdrawal of basic human rights is often cited by clinicians who are reluctant to use involuntary treatment, viewing it as a violation of personal liberty and patient autonomy. Treatment is seen as only likely to be effective in individuals who are motivated to change. And addiction is a matter of individual choice. So let's see, have these kind of issues been addressed with the new Act? They certainly were not addressed with the previous Act. Under the 1912 Act, the, the definition of an inebriate was very, very broad. It meant a person who habitually uses intoxicated liquor or intoxicating drugs to excess. So lots and lots of our patients would meet that criteria. So this was felt to be too broad a definition, and in fact, that broad definition was often used for social control over troublesome behaviour, rather than with a focus on preventing serious harm when there was a lack of capacity to consent to treatment. So let's have a look at the new Act. The definitions uh, for who and who, who can and who cannot come in under involuntary detention are very different. They're very tight, uh, very specific. And we'll go through those. So there are four criteria we'll go through in detail. First of all, there must be evidence of severe dependence, and that's defined as tolerance, withdrawal, and loss of capacity to make decisions. And, as well as that, the patient, person must be at risk of serious harm and likely to benefit from treatment, but has refused treatment, and no less restrictive treatment is available. The severe substance dependence, we all know about tolerance and withdrawal, the, the loss of capacity to make decisions about his or her substance use and personal welfare has to be due primarily to that person's substance dependence. So it can't be related to other factors such as schizophrenia or tra traumatic brain injury. And when we're, when we're talking about this with the magistrates that we meet with, the, the loss of capacity comes down to the kind of compulsive drug-seeking behaviour issues that Loretta was referring to earlier. So you all know this. This is someone developing an addiction. It all started when someone offered me a chocolate thin. After a bad exam, I took two. Soon I was using mallow puffs. I had them around the house, that kind of thing. And before long, I was on three packets a day. That was when the biscuit crisis people found me. So our patients can really relate to that, and, and we know that their autonomy and their self-determination can be compromised due to the behavioural compulsion that is addiction, with that loss of control, that sense of absolute powerlessness and unmanageability related to addiction. Um, capacity can also be impacted on by chronic intoxication and by neurocognitive changes from substance use. We also know that repeated use of addictive drugs may reorganise the brain, brain circuitry of motivation and the use of drugs of abuse may become more salient than natural reinforcers such as food or sex. So essentially the motivational and reward pathways of the brain become hijacked 
by drugs of abuse, including alcohol, and those par biological pathways then prefer the drugs, the alcohol, much more than all the other things that we, we need to do to survive. And for a lot of our patients, this is the scenario they're facing. Alcohol is definitely the treatment that they want, but unfortunately, they've long forgotten what the original question was. As well as severe dependence, there must be um, evidence that care, treatment or control is necessary to protect the person from serious harm. This serious harm may be psychological, it may be physical, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, this is a patient I'm calling Sarah, because um, she takes lots of Seroquel, and she had had um, 27 admissions to Royal North Shore Hospital up until September, October 2012, and they're all in the context of suicide attempts when she had drunk enormous amounts of alcohol and had taken a lot of um, quetiapine. So clearly at risk of serious harm. This is Billy, her, um, short for Billy Rubin. Um, he's a 35-year-old divorced male, and I'm, I'm trying to get you to remember these names because you're following the progress of these patients as we go through the talk. Uh, he came to us and uh, he had end-stage alcoholic liver failure and was told he had six months to live. He had bleeding esophageal varices that precipitated his admission prior to his involuntary treatment with us. And this was so severe that, it, in fact, he was drinking alcohol between episodes of vomiting blood. His Billy Rubin, when he came to us, was over 500. Um, normal is usually 18 and below. And this is a, a paint chart which I've called Fifty Shades of Jaundice. I hope it's not too provocative. Um, I, you know, it has, it, it's not looking, it's gone purple where I am, but where you are, if you have a look down the bottom, the sunny side up, and right at the bottom in the, mar in the middle is marigold. So he was somewhere um, in that category of yellow, and he was like psychedelic yellow when he walked into our unit. So he was clearly at risk of serious harm as well. And the serious harm criteria may also have regard to children and the care of, person, of the person and dependent um, of the person. The, the fetus actually isn't included in the Act and we haven't um, had an opportunity yet to test that out with, with a magistrate. It'd be interesting. Um, the, uh, the next criteria is the person is likely to benefit from treatment for their substance dependence, but has essentially refused treatment. And here we are back to Sarah, who came in, who was having her overdoses of alcohol and quetiapine as, as suicide attempts. Now, we, we weren't sure if she would be able to benefit from treatment in our unit or not. And in fact, when she came into the, we hoped she might. Um, when she came into the unit, in fact, the, the counter-transference, the transference and counter-transference that emerged became very unmanageable for her and difficult for us to manage and being detained was making her more and more distressed. It was not benefiting her. It was in fact becoming harmful and so we made a decision that she wasn't benefiting from treatment and we took her off the order. But what was really good was that involuntary treatment was actually a turning point for her and she was able to engage with a whole range of treatments as an outpatient, including drug and alcohol treatment, psychiatric treatment, and weekly psychotherapy, and she's doing much, much better. So sometimes we can't tell if people are going to benefit from treatment, obviously, until they actually get into the unit. The fourth criteria is there's got to be no other appropriate and less restrictive means for dealing with the person. So all other avenues of treatment have been, and all other um, treatment environments have been explored and have failed, unfortunately. So what safeguards are in place to ensure that patients' civil and human rights are addressed when they're under this Act? Well, first of all, the, the person is not allowed to be detained in treatment initially for more than 28 days. So this business of locking people up for 12 months is no longer able to occur. And as soon as is practical, practicable after the initial dependency certificate is issued by an accredited medical practitioner, the person must be brought before a magistrate. There has to be a hearing, and the magistrate essentially is reviewing what we have done and reviewing our certification and our reasons for detaining someone as an involuntary patient. 
the patient must have legal representation, and so there's always a, a pro uh, there's always a pro bono or free free to the patient barrister or, or solicitor who comes into the unit to see them. All the relevant medical evidence must be provided, treatment notes as well as reports, and there must be evidence of a detailed treatment plan. If we want to extend the order, we can potentially extend it for a further 28 days and then another 30, further 28 days, up to three months maximum. We have to show clear evidence of substance-related brain injury. It's not enough just to extend the order because we want to and we feel a person would benefit and they need more time. There must be evidence of substance-related brain injury. And that must be linked in to the need to continue to develop the treatment plan. Again, there has to be another hearing and there has to be legal representation for the patient. Official visitors um, have to come and review everything that we do every month. So two visitors come every month to our treatment centre, they meet with all the involuntary patients, they review all our records, they go through all our notes, our medication charts, they look at the facilities and they have to provide reports to the principal official visitor but also to the minister. So everything we're doing is very closely scrutinised and I think that's a very good thing. Now one of the major criticisms of involuntary treatment has been that there is a lack of evidence of effectiveness. So it, is that in fact true? In 2014 is that still true? Is there still no evidence of effectiveness? Let's have a look at the literature, let's have a look at what we've tried to pull together. We all know about coercive treatment Coercive treatment is when our patients have the opportunity to choose addic addiction treatment as opposed to receiving some kind of alternative consequence. So it may be that they have a choice of, for example, going to jail or actually engaging with a merit program. Um, there may be coercion around keeping their children that be, may be linked into receiving addiction treatment, and so on. You know this, we use this all the time. It's, it's often incredibly effective, and in fact the, the literature shows that it can be very effective. This is much better studied than involuntary treatment. It's much less contentious, and we know it leads to reduced substance use, criminality, improved health, and improved social outcomes, including employment. But what about the effectiveness for involuntary treatment? Generally, there has been very little um, in the way of research. The studies are heterogeneous. There are small numbers, short periods of follow-up. And the evidence has generally been inadequate and inconclusive, um, indicating that short-term treatment may benefit some people, but really nothing more specific than that. Had a look in the literature, I'm very interested if you've found more studies than we have. There's a, a Swiss case series of 15 involuntary alcohol dependent patients, and um, they followed them up for a median period of 71 weeks. 71 weeks, that's a long time. Um, they found that five of those patients had, had dropped out or one, one had died. But of the ten remaining patients, eight were abstinent and two were drinking in a less severe manner. What I found really interesting was that six out of those ten were still actually committed to a residential institution. They were still involuntarily detained. I thought that was fascinating at 71 weeks. We were only allowed to detain people for up to three months and our average period of time is 28 days. Duong and colleagues in Massachusetts have looked at health service utilisation. They studied 10 patients with chronic alcohol dependence who had really high uh, recidivism rates for emergency department visits and admissions. And they were able to commit them involuntarily for 30 days of what they call MAD, uh, Mandatory Inpatient Alcohol Detoxification. I thought it was a bit of an unfortunate acronym. Um, what they found, and they, they did a pre and post analysis, they looked at the number of hospitalizations, the number of ED visits prior to the mandatory detoxification afterwards, and they found significant reductions for both groups. You can see the figures there. The mean number of hospitalizations were 1.3, prior to the involuntary treatment and point one afterwards. A uh, number of ED visits you can see there also had reduced significantly. 
These results weren't significant at three and six months, although there was still a, a tr notable trend down in terms of number of ED presentations and admissions. And the authors suggested that um, involuntary inpatient treatment is effective over a short period of time and ongoing treatment may be necessary for sustained results. So I'm not really clear from reading that paper what the kind of um, tr aftercare treatment was once the patients left the inpatient detox unit. In terms of our own patient group, and these are very um, preliminary results because we've spent the last two and a half years getting this whole program up and running. Um, but I can tell you a little bit about the kind of patients who are coming through before the, we look at some of the, the preliminary outcomes. So not surprisingly, most of the patients are alcohol dependent, 82%, and 18% were primarily drug dependent, uh, four with amphetamines, one with cannabis, one with opioids and one with benzodiazepines. There are lots of other secondary dependencies and the primary one was um, nicotine, 82%. Um, four patients had opioids as a secondary dependence and, sorry, eight and four were on OST. In terms of the characteristics of the patient group, 55% were male. The mean age was 43 range from 22 to 65. The alcohol group uh, were a, a bit older uh, compared with the non-alcohol group, mean age of 44, the non-alcohol group, mean age of 32. 5.3% were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. 76% were se single, separated or divorced. 18% were homeless. And 92% were on a disability support pension or another benefit. So this was a, a very um, socially disadvantaged group of patients. And this patient group also had a lot of comorbidities. Um, at least 53% had a, a current history of a mental illness. 42% had either self-harmed or attempted suicide at some time. And 40% had... Uh, clear evidence of cerebral atrophy on an MRI or CT brain scan. Now in terms of trying to evaluate um, the effectiveness of what we're doing, first of all we're looking at the objects of the act because that really guides us in terms of what we're supposed to be doing. So the objects of this act are to provide for the involuntary treatment of persons with a severe substance dependence with the aim of protecting their health and safety. So this is not a focus on criminal activity or troublesome behaviour in the community, it's a focus on health and safety. Um, the, another object is to facilitate a comprehensive assessment of those persons and to facilitate the stabilisation of those persons through medical treatments, including withdrawal management. And I think we can very clearly demonstrate, you know, through all our... Uh, records that we have, for most patients, been able to, to do that. This is a bit more interesting in terms of effectiveness. To give those persons the opportunity to engage in voluntary treatment and restore their capacity to make decisions about their substance use and their personal welfare. So is that possible? Is that actually possible to improve insight and motivation? And can capacity to make decisions be restored. In patients who are working in, walking in who are not motivated for change um, and who are refusing to engage in treatment. So let's have a look at that. We've been using the Addenbrooke's cognitive examination for our patients and um, those of you who work in aged care areas will know that a score of around 82 is really bad um, and it, it's, it probably signifies in an aged care population this person has pretty much certainly has dementia. Um, so that's a score of 82. The mean score of our patients in that first week of treatment is around 82. Um, and I have to say that that score done in the first week has been once they're through their alcohol withdrawal and they're off most of their benzodiazepines. So at that stage, most of our patients are looking like dementia patients. And then as they progress through their treatment, this is starting to shift very interestingly. So that by the end of the fourth week, they've actually moved into a score, a mean score of 92 out of 100. And that is, that is in the normal range. So this is significant improvement on a whole range of cognitive domains during the course of their treatment. 
Um, an example of this is Con. I'm calling Con Con because he was very confused. Um, here's a 36-year-old, 33-year-old single male sailor. Um, loved his boats, chronic alcohol dependence. Before he came to us, he'd had a six-week admission, including 18 days in an intensive care unit with liver failure, with hepatic encephalopathy. And when he arrived in our unit, he was just aimlessly wandering, completely disorientated. He couldn't find his room, so he had to have a sign on the door that said, this is Con's room. And even then, he still couldn't find it. Um, the physician who referred him was worried he might have Corsakoffs and that we might see this as a dump, but at this, and that we might have to do lots of work on guardianship and, and finding placement and so on. But it, there was a flicker of hope because the physician who referred him noted that his frontal lobe functioning was just gradually improving. Um, his ASA, however, was 69 out of 100, which was really terrible. Um, but what was very interesting was that he must have had a reversible encephalopathy because after two weeks in treatment in our unit, he, he just woke up and he just became a normal person again. Um, a lively 33-year-old had a great sense of humour. He was like an inpatient comedian. Um, and by the fourth week, his ACE score was 94 out of 100 in the normal level. And four weeks after discharge, he was back working as a deckhand on a ship. So that was extremely interesting. And he'd certainly been able to um, regain capacity. Another object of the Act is to give those persons the opportunity to engage in voluntary treatment. So is there any evidence that this is happening, that patients are engaging in, in voluntary treatment? Uh, in, in treatment? So we looked at the um, service engagement scale, which is often used in mental health, and we looked at um, a month prior to admission and then a month after discharge. The, the scores in the scale, the higher scores indicate poorer engagement. The lower scores indicate much better engagement. And you can see just, um, and this is just raw data, but just looking at the, the um, columns, you can see that our patient group, their scores were much lower after they were discharged. And in fact, they were exhibiting a much better capability of being available for appointments, of collaborating with their treating team, of seeking behaviour, help seeking behaviour when they're in trouble and of adherence to their treatment, including medication. We asked patients, um, we use a treatment motivation scale, we asked them at the end of that first week a range of questions, and one of them well, they had to comment on, you plan, it's a questionnaire, you plan to stay in this treatment program for a while, and the median score was around 6.5, which is close to strongly agree. Most patients agreed or strongly agreed that they actually needed to be there, needed to engage in treatment. And this was a common theme going forward to the magistrate's hearing, that the majority of the patients by that time felt that they actually did need to be in treatment and were relieved to be in treatment. Um, also, most patients were you know, given a, a, a range, a menu of options in terms of pharmacotherapies. The alcohol-dependent group, most of them voluntarily chose to embark on an alcohol pharmacotherapy. This is at discharge, 76% were on baclofen, and the rest were on a range of other pharmacotherapies, some were on a combination. So again, a lot of evidence of engagement um, in treatment. And this has led to the creation of this phrase in our unit, I'm a voluntary, involuntary patient. So our patients acknowledge, yes, they're under an involuntary order, but they're actually voluntarily there engaging in treatment, if you know what I mean. Um, Measures of substance use, we've been using the ATOP, um, and I've got some data looking at what's happening to patients six months after discharge. So this is data on 15, 50 patients who went through the unit over 18 months. And you can see three of those patients, they had a dependency certificate completed in our unit. They went off to the um, Bloomfield Hospital unit, so haven't got their data. Seven patients were drug dependent, Eight were, uh, 40 were alcohol dependent. The seven drug dependent patients, just briefly overall, we haven't got a lot of time, but um, half of them were either abstinent or doing significantly better six months after discharge. The alcohol dependent patient group is a bigger number, still a small number, but a bigger number, very interesting. Uh, the group on the right, um, about half have not done so well 
At six months, tragically, 10% of patients have died. 12% um, we have no data on, we, they were lost to follow up. 25% had clearly relapsed. On the other side, the, the other half, however, were actually doing really well or much improved. Um, the, the blue number, 8%, is interesting. Uh, about 33% were abstinent, and that's in the last four weeks using the ATOP at six months. But the, the small 8% group, they were, they were three patients who were actually abstinent because they were involuntarily detained. Two were in psychiatric hospitals under the Mental Health Act because they were severely mentally ill. It transpired and one patient was um, at Orange under another IDAT order having had a relapse. Now there's 25% of patients were abstinent uh, and living in the community at six months and there's a 20% group who were still drinking um, a lot, more than they should, uh, more than was safe, but they had improved quite a lot. And so the improved group, uh, the quantity and frequency of drinking had reduced. So instead of drinking a mean of 30 standard drinks at admission, this was down to 13 standard drinks. It's still a lot, but I guess for them it's, a, it's heading in the right direction. And drinking days, instead of drinking 28 out of 28 days a month, they were drinking 12 out of 28 days. So really heading in a positive direction. The, th those who were abstinent and, and improved at six months are interestingly all living in the community. None of them had chosen to go off to residential rehab. Um, and all of them were actively engaged in drug and alcohol treatment. Nearly 90% were involved in our assertive um, drug and alcohol involuntary patient aftercare program. We, we need to sit down and try and tease out some of the differences between the two groups. We haven't done that yet. We might wonder if it might be related to uh, the amount of alcohol-related brain impairment, but it looks to be about the same in both groups. And in fact, a third of the group who were abstinent in living in the community, uh, sorry, a third of the group who were doing well had cerebral atrophy on their scans. Our, our treatment program includes an inpatient component but also an assertive outreach component for six months minimum but it's a lot longer for a lot of our patients and this includes assertive outreach, at times home visits, clinic reviews, a weekly day program, phone calls, crisis coordination and brokerage funding to support a range of treatments and also to support housing. So some of the patients who've done really well, um, you've, you've met them already. Con the sailor, he's been abstinent for 16 months um, and he's continuing to work with boats that he loves and he's working about three days a week. He's doing really well. Billy has moved off the chart of Fifty Shades of Jaundice and uh, why don't you have a look at his liver function test and wondering if anyone in the audience can uh, find a reason for that change in liver function test. Billy Rubin's gone from 503 at admission to normal, 19, and his liver function tests are almost normal. Any thoughts about that? He's had a liver transplant. He made it to a liver transplant. Um, and he's, um, and interestingly, he, he did have a little bit of a blowout of drinking once he became well again, but he's on top of that now and he's moved into his own unit. He's about to start work. Health service utilisation, we need to have a look at that. Are we making any difference? As well as looking at health outcomes, we need to look at are we making any difference in terms of um, presentations. You'll remember Mr Baggins with his 56 admissions um, from May to October 2011. We, um, we engaged in a very long-standing, <laughs> very complicated um, process of assessment and stabilisation with him and it went over about eight months and involved at least three involuntary treatment orders with some extensions. This enabled us to determine his, his many comorbidities and I, I guess the, the primary comorbidity that we were able to tease out was that, not surprisingly, he had alcoholic dementia and his housing and, and Department of Housing was completely inappropriate for him and he was at high risk of dying in that unit, of setting fire to that unit and burning himself to death as well as the other occupants of that building. 
So um, this required, and, and we're not a, a dementia unit, but we kind of had to, we've had to become a dementia unit at times. Um, fortunately, with the funding from the IDAP program, we've we've had a neuropsychologist, we have a social worker, an occupational therapist. We've never had those access to those specialists before, and so we were able to conduct extensive neurocognitive testing, a functional OT assessment. We were able to get him under a guardianship order, a financial management order. We were able to find appropriate supported housing for him, which he really liked. And we placed him in this, this housing. Um, and he's continued to have ongoing care coordination with our team. So since the 13th of May 2013, and I went into the, the computer and into power charts to check, um, he's actually had no admissions whatsoever. And, and I think um, this is a reflection of the fact that he's in very stable, supported accommodation. He likes people. He's really happy there. He's got a, real, a strong limit on the amount of money he can access to drink. And he's very well engaged with our, our treatment team and sees his case manager weekly, who's a drug and alcohol nurse therapist and we, we've had to make a lot of kind of paradigm shifts in our drug and alcohol services to accommodate these patients who really need long-term intensive care like patients with schizophrenia. Um, I've put the money picture there because I think we need to be doing some analyses of the kind of um, cost effectiveness of running a program like this. Uh, looking at health service utilisation and I've put the picture down in the bottom just because I guess for us uh, although our patient, Mr Baggins, was, is often really, really cranky with us, we've kind of become his de facto fam family in the absence of any other family. Now, looking at Mr Baggins, probably as you heard his story initially, uh, you probably thought, um, oh, OMG, not another chronic alcoholic, this is a heart sink patient, a get out of my emergency room patient, um, a hopeless case. McCormick and his colleagues have written about these patients and have suggested that we should be using alternative phrases. We usually refer to them as highly vulnerable patients, severely dependent, addicted patients. McCormick and their team call them gravely disabled patients, I really like that term, and in need of humane, effective and equitable care. McCormick has said almost always they are discharged quickly with documentation citing non-adherence against medical advice. On average they have six comorbidities, 92% have a psychiatric diagnosis, 41% focal brain injury, and they have an annual mortality of 8.6%, more than 20 times their expected age adjusted rate. McCormick says People with grave alcohol use disorders should be seen as a subgroup of patients in the same way as those with trauma or acute myocardial infarction, i.e. they need a specific care pathway. And certainly our, our experience has been that involuntary detention may be a stepping stone to, to such uh, specific care. So my conclusions. In terms of our treatment program, we do see involuntary treatment as a measure of last resort for severe life-threatening dependence where all other options have been exhausted. And a lot of the patients that we have seen have had a lot of intensive work um, from drug and alcohol services like those that you work in, really, really dedicated drug and alcohol staff who put their heart and soul into trying to engage these patients as you do day in, day out. And despite that, um, it was impossible to engage these patients. So I think there is definitely a role for involuntary treatment as, as facilitating that um, re-engagement, that uh, recovering capacity. We always try to balance the deprivation of liberty with due process and effective and humane care. And we allow patients to choose or not choose if they're unwilling from a range of evidence-based treatment options, including assertive aftercare. We are collecting data, but we do need proper evaluation of effectiveness, of cost effectiveness, of the ethical aspects. And um, Hall and others have suggested that we need to look at um, considering a randomised controlled trial. I think, <coughs> think randomising this group 
um, is, is complicated and I think possibly the randomization could be to involuntary treatment and assertive outreach. So that would be a really interesting study. If anyone's got some funds out there, I end up. Um, and finally, we don't believe it is better to allow individuals to die with their rights on rather than receive treatment. We do believe in the paradox of involuntary treatment, that sometimes we need to consider to be denying autonomy in order to create it. And my thanks to all those members of our team and staff um, who have helped set up the program and continue to work in a dedicated fashion in that program. This is our team on a usual day. I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that. And this is our team on a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. That was a, a fantastic.